a hundred times more powerful than a, a classical telescope. Well, that's got scam written all over it. So it is also easy to control with your smartphone, thus making astronomy easier to share. Okay, now I'm sure. If you've ever looked through a telescope before, there are a couple of things you never do. Never, you never touch the telescope while you're looking through it, especially something as flimsily mounted as this. It just shakes the image way too much. And secondly, are you seriously trying to do astronomy from inside a brightly lit conservatory? $2 million raised as well. Look, it's even got pictures of a normal telescope and the EV scope. Well, that can't be right. I have a, a normal telescope, and this is what a picture of the Eagle Nebula looks like through my telescope. Uh, on M16, doing a two minute exposure. This to a star is some insignificant fraction of the universe. Right, our exposure is finished of the Eagle Nebula. There he is. Is the thing, that's the Eagle, obviously. This is the thing that Hubble took all the pictures of. Of, and they're called the pillars of creation and the areas of star formation. But if, sorry, but if you were like the Hubble telescope or something, I could believe it. But this ain't a hundred times better than any of my telescopes. And none of my telescopes are particularly fancy. Look, you're talking about what you can see through the eyepiece, right? Years later, I thought of an instrument capable of accumulating light in a unique way. Accumulating light in a unique way? What, you mean like astrophotography has been doing for the last hundred plus years? You just point the telescope at one point in space and accumulate more and more light. And then you can display it on a computer screen or a viewer somewhere. I mean, that's not what you're doing. You've done something completely unique, right? Capable of accumulating light in a unique way, so we could finally see those nebulae, those galaxies. All in a matter of seconds and directly through its lens. Nope, they've just put an imager at the prime focus of the telescope. Damn, this was nothing new when I was doing it about 10 years ago. And even back then, if I put a digital SLR at the prime focus of the telescope, I could take pictures like this in about 10 seconds. Or like this in about 2 minutes. So basically, the EV scope doesn't have an eyepiece. You can never look through the telescope and that fundamentally limits what it can do. I think what you actually mean is you're going to stick a gimmick viewer on your telescope, which let's be honest, if you're going to have a viewer, don't put it on the telescope. Like I was saying, if you're taking long exposures or trying to record anything through a telescope, the last thing that you want to do is touch the telescope because it shakes the telescope. And that's true if your telescope is mounted like a tank, like this one. But doubly so if the mounting on your telescope is flyweight and shaky. I thought it was amazing. Um, I actually majored in physics and was really interested in astronomy when I was at MIT. Um, and really used to look through a lot of hobby telescopes and this was some of the best that I've seen. Uh, no. The only guy who would make a comment like this is someone who knows almost nothing about astronomy. But hang on, didn't he say that he was, he did his degree in astronomy or something? Well, well he's listed here as, as John Hopkins University. I wonder what department he's in. <laughs> Psychology and brain science. Maybe, just maybe that was something more pertinent and worth mentioning than just name dropping MIT. Look, almost no one, especially someone who does astronomy as a hobby, would use a scope this small because it simply lacks optical performance. And let's for the moment just take the best claim that the EV scope makes at face value, that it can record images like this, comparable to what you could snap in, you know, 10 seconds, 10 years ago. But that's basically the only thing the EV scope can do. And let me tell you something, back in the day when you had to freeze your ass off manually guiding the scope for about half an hour to get an image on chemical film. To get a picture like this, it meant something. It took skill and dedication. So now I can just push a button and 44 seconds later, this pops up on the camera. 
Sure, it looks awesome, but the easy button also means the novelty of seeing this sort of thing wears off pretty quick. What I saw was this vivid, intensely colored uh, planetary nebula, just like the photographs you see in books. Sure, that's the Dumbbell Nebula, one of the brightest and most easy to photograph nebulas in the sky. I mean, it's like a, a 30 second exposure I took of it some 10 years ago. And here's what it looks like if you do a search for it online. So what you're looking at is... Oh, wow. It's okay. beautiful, isn't it? It's the Dumbbell Nebula, a star that exploded. There's a tiny little camera at the top which is picking up the image from the light from the object we're looking at, and it's sending that to a projection device which you're looking through. So it's taking individual pictures over every few seconds, and slowly it's overlaying those, so you're starting to see a better and better image. You'll never get to see that through a normal telescope. No, no, you, you could never do that with a, a normal telescope, unless you've got a camera, say, for instance. In which case, you see something like this about 30 seconds later. Congratulations, you've just reinvented astrophotography. You'll never get to see that through a normal telescope. The simple reality is visual astronomy feels a lot more personal when the photons from the distant galaxy or whatever are actually falling into your eyes. Rather than just, you know, looking at an iPad or looking at an iPad through a lens for some bizarre reason. So about 10 years ago, I took this photograph of the M101 supernova. Very impressive. There it is, a star burning almost as bright as the rest of the galaxy. But the simple reality was that even though it looked nowhere near as impressive looking at it visually through the telescope, the mere fact that you were looking directly at a star that was exploding as bright as the rest of the galaxy put together was actually a much more profound experience. 20 million years ago, long before mankind was even walking upright, let alone backing the rocks together, a white dwarf star in a distant galaxy reached a critical mass and exploded with a violence that can scarcely be countenanced. At such a brief time, it shone with comparable luminosity to the rest of the entire galaxy. A supernova. Now, some 20 million years later, that light's just about to reach the Earth. Indeed, it's shining on me right now. The telescope's pointing right at it. It's just, you can't see it yet because it's lost in the late evening twilight. However, later, in the full dark, I'm going to show you that supernova. It's sort of the difference between looking at photos and actually being there. There's a whole different ambience to it. And honestly, for me, some of my most enjoyable astronomy moments are things like when I was just dozing under the desert stars with a cheap pair of binoculars, which are awesome for the price. And, you know, you periodically wake up and you look around at the sky, watching the eternity of the heavens scroll into view as the Earth rotates. So for imaging deep sky objects, the EV scope offers performance of a $1,000 type imaging platform for the amazing price of $3,000. With the obvious exception that with a regular telescope, you can do other things with it because it doesn't have a sensor locked in there at the prime focus of the telescope. So how badly would this limit the performance of the EV scope? Telescopes typically look at a small area of the sky. And just to demonstrate this, by curious chance, back in 2011, I actually did this video of a zoom in on the patch of the sky where the Eagle Nebula is, just to give you a, a feel for the size of the objects that you're typically looking at. And the Eagle Nebula is relatively big compared to the small objects in the sky which are things like planets. I mean, you may have noticed that on my channel, you know, when I do something astro, it's very rarely of, here is a picture of a nebula. You know, it, it's frequently about watching the solar system move, watching solar flares or the rotation of the sun, watching the rotation of the moon or sunset on the craters on the moon. The rotation of Jupiter, something that you can record over the period of a night. Or the movement of Uranus and its moons against the background stars, or the transit of Venus, or solar eclipses, or whatever. There are a lot of interesting things in the solar system. Things that are different every time you look at them. 
none of which you could really look at through the EV scope, most notably the planets. I mean, it'll be outclassed easily by a telescope that costs one tenth of the price. Now, this isn't some minor niggle. Planets are some of the most interesting things to look at in the sky. The moons of Jupiter, the rings of Saturn, the phases of the moon of, of Venus. Okay, it's not perfect, but. Oh, wow, sounds Venus for a telescope. Yeah, and that's just to give you an idea of how much touching the telescope will shake things up. And just so we're all clear on the rough dimensions, this is Venus seen through about a, a $400 telescope, a 5-inch Maxutov Cassegrain. And the size of the planet there is about the same angular size as Jupiter appears. And this is Jupiter seen through a, a significantly more expensive telescope, about an 8-inch Schmidt Cassegrain. Okay, this is Jupiter a little further on. Just putting the... Uh camera up on the eyepiece. But again, to see detail on Jupiter, you're critically dependent on how still the atmosphere is. Which is why Saturn looks so depressingly bad here. Because of the atmospheric shimmer. None of these things will be good through this $3,000 telescope, with the possible exception of the moon. And just to give you a feel of the performance that you might expect, this is the sort of thing you would expect to get off the EV scope, which is locked off at prime focus. Whereas this is the sort of image you'll get out of a telescope that costs one third the amount of the EV scope. And that's what you'll see live from the eyepiece. You see, telescopes are limited by two things, resolution and light gathering. Resolution defines how small or how close together two things you can actually split up with the telescope and light gathering defines how faint an object you can see. So, double the diameter of the telescope and you can see things about half the size. So, if you're trying to resolve double stars, double the diameter of the mirror or the lens, you can about half the angular size at which you can split up two stars or something. Or if you're looking at a planet, you increase the number of visible features on that planet by a factor of four. Doubling the diameter of the mirror means you double the area of the mirror, which means you quadruple the light that you gather with your telescope. So uh, a normal classical 18-inch telescope like this will gather four times as much light as the EV scope, and it'll give you four times as much detail on Jupiter as the EV scope. So at this point, how do you not call the EV scope branding itself as a, a hundred times more powerful than a classical telescope? A simple fraud. Or looked at another way, the EV scope has the optical performance of a $150 telescope for an amazing $3,000 price tag. So with a normal telescope, prime focus will give you a, a view of a rather large area of the sky which is not so bad for big, faint objects. But if you want to look at small objects, you need an eyepiece in there. Just so we're all on the same page here, this is what the EV scope claims its field of view will look like. Jupiter is one of the angularly largest planets that you can see, and this is how big it would appear through the EV scope. You would actually be better off for looking at Jupiter buying the $150 telescope because you can put an eyepiece in there which increases the magnification. The resolution of the telescope is exactly the same. That's defined by the mirror size. But the eyepiece allows that image to appear bigger. Okay, this is Jupiter a little further on. Just putting the uh, camera up on the eyepiece. And there is no way of doing this on the EV scope you are locked in at a certain magnification. It's okay for some deep sky objects, but it's going to suck for planets. But even if you could put a, an eyepiece into this four and a half inch entry level scope, it just wouldn't compete. The sweet spot for telescopes is about eight inches. It's just the magical spot between ease of use, cost, and performance. It's about four times the light gathering of the EV scope and four times the detail that you would see on a planet like Jupiter or Saturn. 
And at this point, you've got to realize that astronomy is not and never will be a push-button hobby. Telescopes have to focus light within a wavelength of that light, which is less than a micron. You start to need to know things about how to keep your optics clean, how to collimate your telescopes and maintain a good focus. You learn that you've got to leave the telescope outside to equilibrate the temperature, to get the best optical performance, and so forth. You learn how the planets move and how the Earth spinning on its axis and traveling around the sun alters what you see at nighttime at different times of the year. Me, I started astronomy with a three inch refractor. It was exceptionally limited, almost as bad as the EV scope. I was a 10 year old kid with a hundred dollar telescope I got for Christmas, struggling to do anything. I knew nothing. And in the end, yeah, yeah, I was just trying to find a star with the telescope. Now, it turned out that that bright star that I wanted to look at turned out to be Saturn. And I was completely blindsided by this, that all of a sudden, all there I was just looking for a star in the sky. And you see Saturn as this perfect little gem just sat there on the velvet mat of space. It was one of the most awesome and formative experiences of my life. And from that moment on, I was committed. Many years of delivering papers later, I got myself an 8-inch Dobsonian, which is the, basically the best optical performance for the least dollars. But it gets the job done, and I still use it when I go back to England. So it's maybe the first thing that you learn when you look through a telescope is, damn, is the Earth spinning quickly? The Earth rotates, well, almost once per day. And if your telescope isn't driven, and things are going to drift out of the field of view pretty quick. So you need to drive the telescope mount to compensate for the Earth's rotation. Well, if your telescope's got no drive, like my early telescope did, you've got to compensate for the Earth's rotation yourself. It takes some getting used to. It takes some skill. Turn off the tracking. The Earth's going to continue rotating. So this is what happens if your if your scope isn't driven. So I'm turning off the tracking. Three, two, one, now. So that what you're looking at there is the rotation of the Earth. Uh, so you see things drift out of the field at quite a rate, but you can see it. it it's actually a sort of fair, fair job just to actually keep the telescope pointing in the right direction. Now you get used to it fairly quickly. Um, you know, count, you, you know which way the Earth's rotating. You've got to get it over here somewhere, and you let it drift through the field of view. You get a nice view of it, and you bring it back again, and so it keeps going. And finding faint objects takes some skill, and learning about star hopping and averted vision. If you look directly at the fuzz patch, because your eyes aren't, when you look directly at something, you use the colour sensitive portion of your eyes, which isn't actually that light sensitive. However, when you look away from these things using something called averted vision, then you use the, um, what is it, the cones. Um, or is it the rods? I forget. No, it's the cones. Cones are the sensitive part. And when you do that, um, from this fuzz patch, you start to resolve it as millions and millions of stars. And you, it's in this sense that global clusters really do have this wow factor to them. Now, if you've got a bit more money than I did, and you're really not into sort of moving the telescope yourself, you can get a mount that compensates for the Earth's rotation. But again, to set it up, you've got to understand some stuff. So there are two types of mounts that do this. The first is simple. One of the telescope's axes is parallel with the Earth's axis of rotation. And then it just rotates once per day around that axis. And that's it. That's all you need to do. And in practice, they look like this, the German equatorial mount. So to set it up, all you've got to do is align one of those axes parallel to the axis the Earth spins on. And you're basically done. Now, it turns out to do that about right ain't so difficult. To do it precisely, such that the telescope points at exactly the same point within the resolution of the telescope over the period of hours, eh, that's still pretty hard work. But if you just want something that's roughly aligned, it's the simplest thing to set up ever. You just go outside, you point that axis due north with an elevation equal to your latitude, and boom, you're done. Now, such amount will more or less double the price of your telescope. But after that, tracking is not so bad. 
Then you get the alt azimuth type drives, which are in some ways easier to set up, in some ways more of a pain in the ass. The first thing you've got to do is tell the telescope where you are on Earth. It needs to know the latitude and the time. The more advanced ones will do this by GPS. Then the telescope needs to know what it's pointing at. So you have to point at the bright star and change the telescope knows the time. From that, it works out how it's going to drive itself to track whatever it's pointing at. Now, none of this is remotely new. My sky cannon here would do this over a decade ago. After three years of development, we now have a fully working prototype that we demoed all summer. But we need the support to go further. Join us and transform astronomy forever. And it wasn't particularly new technology back then. Now, when you know what you're doing here, the setup only takes a few minutes. And further, once the telescope knows what it's pointing at and all that sort of thing, it'll find objects for you. Which, in some ways, is nice. In some ways, not so much. A lot of the fun that you get out of uh, visual astronomy is actually finding the objects yourself. Now, there are next-generation type gadgets that will actually do all the alignment for you. So you need to know absolutely nothing. You just plug it in, and it sort of moves around for a bit, and it finds some bright stars on its own. And again, those have been available for a couple of years now. Fairly pricey, but they're available. So if you wanted a four and a half inch go-to type telescope, it would set you back about $300. And that gives you exactly the same optical and tracking performance as the $3,000 EV scope. Sorry, it'll give you inferior optical performance because with the $300 telescope, it still has the versatility that you can either use it as an optical telescope by sticking a, an eyepiece in it or using it for imaging by sticking a camera on it. Now, I can sort of see the market that they were aiming for here. You know, the push button iPhone generation, just push a button on the telescope and boom, it'll do everything for you for 3,000 euros. Now, for the record, $3,000 will get you a, a top banana Rolls Royce type visual photographic rig, not some entry level telescope. Incidentally, you should notice that even here, with the uh, entry-level telescopes, the find objects for you is a sales pitch. Take that with a massive grain of salt. There's a learning curve on all of these things. But the EV scope, they've partnered with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. They can get involved in searching for asteroids, even the search for extraterrestrials. If we saw an alien tonight, it would make That'd my evening. scary, wouldn't it? Maybe they're here now <laughs> watching. What we'd like is a networked system of cameras, the sort of thing that Unistellar is planning on, where we can go back and search through the raw data from one or many cameras. <laughs> it's like, what? How on earth you plan to aid in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence by using one of the smallest and most limited telescopes on the planet? With thousands of eviscopes distributed all around the planet, We'll be able to increase our knowledge in astronomy. We'll be able to study asteroids, comets, supernovae, and even these unknown astronomical events. Oh, the, the unknown astronomical events. I know you're making it all up. Carmen, there's an 80 foot satellite dish sticking out of your ass. Oh boy, the aliens are going to make first contact. But for us or the rest of it, what does any of that have to do with the search for extraterrestrial life? With the EVScope, contributing to science is simple and entertaining. All you need to do is activate campaign mode on our app. It will allow you to receive observation requests from scientists directly on your smartphone. For instance, you'll be able to see and track a near-Earth asteroid while helping it study. Let's just call me ultra skeptical that there's a load of astronomers out there who are really keen on the contribution from uh, citizen scientists with their toy level telescopes operated by people who know nothing about astronomy. You know, from a site deeply unsuited to astronomy, like say for instance, the middle of Paris. Then, transfer the coordinates to your eviscope at the touch of a finger and harvest data about an event all the while seeing it happening directly through the eyepiece. But let's just give it to them for free, that they can get some sort of parallax-type measurement on near-Earth objects. Really skeptical about that being possible with such a limited machine, but whatever, we'll give it to them for free. 
With the EVScope, contributing to science is simple and entertaining. Do you know how boring this would be to watch through the eyepiece? All the while seeing it happening directly through the eyepiece. All asteroids appear as star-like in telescopes of any size. And further, they move really slowly. So all you're going to see through your telescope is the very slightest movement of a star over the period of hours. It would be one of the most boring things to spend hours watching through a $3,000 telescope. For instance, you'll be able to see and track a near-Earth asteroid while helping it study. Especially when there are already robotic telescopes. You know, just take as one example. The 48-inch Sky Survey Telescope at the Palomar Observatory. Hundreds of times the light gathering of the EV scope. Over a hundred times better resolution than the EV scope. And it's situated at a dark sky site. You know, not operated by amateurs in Paris. But one other thing that is critical to remember. Telescopes are almost always limited by the atmosphere. If you live under somewhat murky skies, you're wasting your time trying to see faint objects. You'll just never get the contrast and they'll be lost in the murk. All the EV scopes in the world won't change that. And honestly, if you live in a place that's murky or has bad light pollution, which is about half the places I've lived in in the world, your only real option is planetary astronomy. For that, you don't need particularly clear skies, but you do need the sky to be still. And even here, you run into more or less the same limitations, and the optimum size for a telescope is about 8 inches. And if the Imperial units bug people, well, I'm sorry, but telescope diameters are still mostly measured in inches. 4 inches is small, 6 will just about get the job done, 8 is where the sweet spot is, and 11 is getting a bit big to handle. But for those who desperately need it in SI, 8 inches is about 200 millimeters. So if you want to know where to start? I would start with the 8 inch Dobsonian. Learn your way around the sky. It'll give you solid views of the planet, four times as much light gathering and better views of the planet for one sixth of the cost of the EV scope. If you've got more cash, honestly, I've been fairly impressed with this thing as mount. It's got a self contained battery, but no GPS. It's got a fast and relatively quick single star alignment if you're willing to give it your location and time, which makes it very good if you just want to go out and do some quick planetary observing. Now, if you favor planets, long focal length is your friend. So these are the maxit of Cassegrains grains in three, five, and seven inches. The central obstruction tends to be smaller, which means they're better for planets. It also means they have better resolution. Uh, so this is a focal length of about 1.2 meters, 1.5 meters. This is a, a, a solid performer um, for a relatively mid-priced telescope. This thing is getting up into specialized territory in that it's got a 3 meter focal length, um, which really does mean it, it, it's a planet killer. <laughs> this thing uh, is superb for planets and... Eh, not so versatile for everything else. If you want wide field for seeing whole nebulas in the field of view, that sort of thing, short focal length is your friend. The 8 inch Schmidt Cassegrain has its flaws, most notably the large central obstruction, which, which means you lose some of the light gathering capability of the telescope. It also means it kind of messes up the potential resolution of the telescope. For the best resolution of the telescope, you need an unobstructed aperture, which is what you get with the refractors. And so this is a 6 inch Schmidt, this is an 8 inch Schmidt on a German equatorial mount. It's, you know, it's, it's not light, but it's eminently portable. You know, I've taken these things around the world. This is a 8 inch Schmidt on a, uh, you know, driven Altaz, which is again, really fairly light. I've got to admit, if I'm doing... Uh, so if I want versatility, I would go for one of these now. If we go up much bigger than the 8, we go up to the 11 inch. The, uh, the Sky Cannon. And at this point, they really do get uh, very heavy and very difficult to move around. Uh, that's really 
the largest telescope one guy can sensibly handle. It's got great light gathering capability. It's got almost four times the light gathering capability of that guy, but it's also about four times as hard to move around. If you're under mediocre skies and you want portability and you want performance, this is about where all the factors converge. So why did I spend all of that money on this Sky Cannon? Especially when where I lived in America at the time, it was kind of useless because the skies just weren't clear enough. Well, that's true. But the simple reality is, when on vacation under the clear desert stars, I had the time of my life. So this is pretty much a first for me. As you can see, the sun's pretty much full risen. And uh, so I had the telescope here doing a time lapse all the way up there on the moon. I happen to know Jupiter's right next to the moon, or fairly close to it. So I told the telescope to go find Jupiter for me. And thus he does. And so, there you go, that's Jupiter. In the full light of day. So that really is Jupiter. Move the telescope a little. There we go, Jupiter in the full light of day. And the Sky Cannon costs about the same as the EV scope. There is no world, no world at all where any astronomer worth their salt would take an entry level one trick pony like the EV scope over a Sky Cannon. I mean, even the top of the range eight inch version of this clocks in at about half of the price of the EV scope with four times the optical performance. But don't just take my word for it. There are people out there who take astronomy much more seriously than me. People who have the clear skies and much better astronomical setups. People for whom my best efforts here would count as amateur hour. You know, big blurry stars, slight field rotation and all that sort of thing. And they hang out on forums like Cloudy Night, where you will find the EV scope getting raked over the coals for very much the same reasons that I've went over here. And as for their ability to integrate all of this with the apps and all that sort of thing, let's just say I'm skeptical about that too. You know, what with it currently being over a year late. Yeah, I got one word for anyone trying to sell a $3,000 telescope with the optical performance of a $300 telescope. All on the promise that it's going to be a hundred times more powerful than a regular telescope busted. So hope you enjoyed that. And if you think you're getting into astronomy, well, I hope you found this video useful. And below you'll find a load of links to all the telescopes that I went over in this video in my Amazon store below. You know, that one's costing less than $3,000. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the subscribe and notification bell to make sure you don't miss out on new uploads. And uh, thanks for watching.